Welcome to part two of the Staying Lean Year Round series. This one is all about exercise protocols to stay lean year round. Now this isn't about, hey, lift this amount of weight, lift this, do this. It's more about here's how you should structure your cardio days, your HIIT days, your resistance training days, all in conjunction with the previous video that was the nutritional protocol to stay lean year round. So in case you missed it, the previous video, that which was part one, was all about leveraging specific nutritional timing strategies to maximize our mitochondrial efficiency and mitochondrial density so that we ultimately burn more fat. So quick recap. Okay, the quick recap was ultimately you want to be fasting a couple days per week, followed by a low carb, low fat day, followed by a surplus day. And the reason behind this is we want to maximize the amount of mitochondria that we have. Mitochondria utilizes fat for fuel, okay? It utilizes any you know, fuel for energy, but it utilizes fat. So the more mitochondria we have, the more energy powerhouses we have to create energy, okay? Then we want to improve mitochondrial efficiency. We want that mitochondria to be more effective at burning fat. So if you missed that video, you should go back and watch it before you come back here because it's all gonna work together. Then tomorrow we talk about supplements, then the next day we talk about recovery, and then we have a grocery haul related to this whole staying lean year round. Okay, let's dive into the exercise piece. But first, please do hit the red subscribe button and then hit that bell icon and turn on notifications so you always see our videos and you see the rest of the series as well. Okay, exercise alone is going to improve the amount of mitochondria you have, period straight up. But this video isn't designed to be super basic like that. We all know that exercise is good and exercise will help you stay lean. But what's happening is when you exercise, the reason that you're getting more effective is because your body upregulates the production of, an en of its energy factories. Okay, You're working out, it says, uh-oh, I need to produce more energy and I'm adapting to this, so it creates more factories to create energy. And it gets more efficient at utilizing fat as a fuel source. Okay, so let's talk about how we can leverage this. The first thing we need to look at is aerobic work, cardio. And so many people will tell you, I never do cardio and that's how I stay so lean. Uh, look at it. cardio is still a very, very good way to burn fat. It is how you actively will burn fat. You leverage other mechanisms to get your mitochondrial, mitochondria more functioning or functioning better and you utilize the cardio to actually be the fire itself, okay? So cardio is not bad. What we have to look at is aerobic work or cardio increases mitochondrial density. It increases the amount of mitochondria that is in a given muscle. If you work your leg a whole lot and you run on your legs a lot, then of course your legs are going to have no choice but to create more energy factors, factories as an adaptation. You're also going to increase your amount of myoglobin. Okay, myoglobin is what stores oxygen in a given tissue. So again, same thing with the legs. You create more energy factories, you're going to create more oxygen storehouses, to immediately be able to create energy at a moment's notice. And then also you have angiogenesis, okay? So when you work out, you do cardio, you create more blood vessels, you create more capillaries, i.e. delivering more blood, delivering more oxygen to the mitochondria, burning fat faster. But the biggest thing we have to talk about, because in yesterday's video, we talked about how important it is to activate AMPK. AMPK is the energy sensor in your body that recognizes, oh, I'm deprived of calories. I need to start utilizing my fat stores. Cardio activates AMPK and activates it well. And then, not only that, it upregulates that PGC1A that I talked about. In other words, cardio itself mechanically increases biogenesis of your mitochondria, but it also indirectly, chemically, creates more mitochondria. And this is very important. Now, what's really interesting to know, most people on the internet will tell you low intensity cardio is best for burning fat. And that's not incorrect, but it's not practical. Okay? When you work out at a low intensity, or you cardio at a low intensity, as a percentage, you use more fat, relatively speaking, compared to carbohydrates, but the absolute amount of fat that you use is significantly less. You're better off training your cardio at a moderately high intensity. Here's a fun fact. You don't really start seeing a decline in the amount of fat that is used for fuel during cardio until about 70% of your maximum intensity. That means you can train at 69.999% and still use fat as a fuel source. So you don't need to waste your time doing two hours at 30% on a treadmill. I would rather you go 69% for 20 minutes and burn more fat even though you sacrifice this much in the way of carbohydrates and maybe muscle. It's minuscule. But the best thing is, the more that you condition, the more that you push yourself a little bit with cardio, the higher that number gets. And what that means is, you're able to burn fat at a higher intensity. If I were to really condition myself really, 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 really well, 
I might hypothetically be able to burn fat all the way up to 85% of my max intensity, which is great because that means that I can run for 10 minutes at 85% and burn fat. So point is, is cardio is your friend. We just have to allocate it to the right day. There's a study that was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology that showed that just six weeks of pushing your cardio with a little bit of intensity resulted in a 40% increase in mitochondrial biogenesis. 40%, 40% more mitochondria in a given area. Okay, that's 40% more energy factories able to potentially burn fat when you're not working out. This whole goal is about creating more and more efficient mitochondria so that we burn more fat and stay lean year round. Now I'm gonna talk about when to apply the exercise strategy a little bit later in this video. Now let's jump over to low volume, high intensity interval training, which is super effective also at improving mitochondrial biogenesis, even more effective than steady state cardio, okay? But we have a solution, okay? There is a practical use for both. There are some studies that show that low volume, high intensity uh, interval training, which is where you're not doing a lot, but you're doing short, really hard sprints or whatever, improve mitochondrial biogenesis by 56% and improve the protein content of PGC1A by 24%, therefore upregulating more mitochondrial biogenesis down the line. I digress. The point is, is it's very powerful. There was a unique study that was published in the FASEB journal. And this study took a look at uh, four weeks of three different groups, okay? One group trained at 200% peak power in an interval fashion, like really going all out for a few seconds. Another group trained at 90% peak power intervals, and another group trained at 65% constant. Okay, well, what they found is that the 200% group had a significant, significant improvement in mitochondrial biogenesis that the other groups did not. And they also saw a 60 to 90% increase in, once again, the protein content of PGC1A, indicating that as far as stimulating the creation of more mitochondria, that was very effective because later on down the line, the body adapted and created more mitochondria. I do want to talk some high intensity interval training tips really fast. It is very important when you're doing HIT that you do your high intensity sprint or your cardio or whatever it is for a short amount of time, push it all the way. It shouldn't be more than like 20 seconds and then recover for however long it takes. Okay, do not let yourself just get winded and then start again when you're winded. You should recover. If it takes you a minute, great. Two minutes, great. Three minutes, great. The power is in the workload, in the peak power that you're putting out for that short amount of time, not in the recovery. You are not trying to train your VO2 max. That's not the goal. You're trying to train yourself metabolically. So here's the breakdown between high intensity interval training and steady state cardio. High intensity interval training is going to be epic at creating more mitochondria. Okay, it creates more mitochondria so that you are just leaner in general. Steady state cardio utilizes that mitochondria aggressively. So it's a balance. We use HIT to create a massive amount of it, and then we use steady state to leverage it to burn fat. So that being said, your steady state cardio works really well on the days where you're doing your low carb, low fat strategy that I talked about in the previous video. Okay, that's why it just, it's just effective. Steady state cardio is going to make you hungry, so it's not the best one to do on a fasting day because it's going to be difficult to fast and you have different hormones that kind of counteract it, okay? Your high intensity interval training days are best on your fasting days. I don't recommend doing resistance training on your fasting days in this particular case. Don't get me wrong, it's absolutely okay. If we have other choices here, that's what we're looking at. Simply because the high intensity interval training will actually elicit some satiating hormones that make it so you don't feel that hungry. So it just makes life a little bit easier, okay? What this is doing is during your fasting days, you're having a massive explosion of mitochondrial biogenesis uh, hormones and genetic expression, okay? Happening from your fasting and happening from your HIIT. It's just a perfect storm, okay? Steady state cardio, a little bit less in the way of biogenesis from the cardio and then a little bit less in the way of biogenesis because you're actually eating food on that day. Now let's talk resistance training for a second. Okay, resistance training should really be on your surplus days. And this kind of goes without saying. Your calorie load or your calorie expenditure on a resistance training day isn't gonna be that high. That's not why we're worrying about eating food on resistance day. We're worried about consuming more food on a resistance day because resistance training is already stimulating inflammation and recovery. And eating is going to stimulate inflammation and recovery. If you're going to be inflamed, you might as well be on, inflamed on a day that you're resistance training and leave your inflammation to one day because fasting is anti-inflammatory. All this AMPK activation is anti-inflammatory. You might as well have mTOR activation and massive just inflammation response all in one day, get it over and done with and let it all be a part of recovery. What you should be eating after your workouts and things like that, again, 
high amounts of protein. And I will, again, once again, down below in the description, there is a link to Thrive Market. Okay, I've assembled different groceries and things that will work for this protocol. So Thrive Market, again, is an online membership-based grocery store. They are super cool. They've partnered up with me on this project. So check them out down below in the link and you can check out Thrive Market. You can get your groceries delivered right to your doorstep. You can get things I recommend for fasting, for keto, for thyroid support, for hormone support, things like that, all my different boxes and bundles. So please do check them out down below in the description. Big thank you to Thrive Market for supporting this and making this series possible as well. So please do, even if you just wanna scope them out, check them out after you watch this video down below in the description. So when it comes to resistance training though, there's a study that was published in the Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports and Exercise. Okay, it took a look at uh, the effect of mitochondria from resistance training. And it was previously thought that resistance training would actually have a negative effect on the mitochondria. Turns out that resistance training improved the respiratory capacity of mitochondria. So I don't know if you're tracking with me here, but what were the two things that I said we want to focus on the most? Increasing the amount of mitochondria, mitochondrial biogenesis, and eating, increasing the efficiency of the mitochondria. Weight training increases the efficiency because it's improving the respiratory capacity. So now you see where I'm going with this. We're leveraging weight training on our calorie surplus days where mitochondrial biogenesis isn't happening all that much anyway, but we are radically affecting the mitochondrial efficiency. We're improving how powerful that mitochondria is on our resistance training days, and then we're creating more of it on our cardio and our HIIT days, okay? So cardio and HIIT, more mitochondria, resistance training, honing that skill and making that mitochondria more powerful. Building more factories, staffing them up. Building more factories, staffing them up. Now, I know what you're thinking. You wanna resistance train more than two days per week on your surplus days. That's absolutely fine. If you're going to combine the two uh, because you want more resistance training days, I would recommend resistance training along with your steady state cardio on your non-fasting days, okay? On your lower carb, lower fat days. Why is that? Twofold. One, it's just the best, you know, metabolically economical way to do it. But also there's some interesting science that shows that a little bit of steady state cardio accompanied with resistance training improves the whole mitochondrial biogenesis and that whole effect anyway, thereby long-term possibly improving your fat loss. So if you do more resistance training, do your resistance training on your caloric surplus days and a little bit on your low carb, low fat days as well. Let's recap so all of this is together so you have a protocol. Again, you really should watch that first video to get the idea. You should be doing your steady state cardio on your low carb, low fat days, okay? 20, 30 minutes at 70-ish percent of your max intensity. Push it pretty hard, okay? That's going to work for you. You should be doing your high intensity interval training on your uh, fasting days. Now, I recommend doing your hit with upper body. I recommend doing battle ropes. I recommend doing burpees. Don't just go do cardio. Use your full body and do it for 20, 30 seconds. Recover, move to a different move. 20, 30 seconds, recover, move to a different move. It's just explosive and cardio oriented, but using the full body whenever possible. Lift or do your heaviest resistance training days on your surplus days. So you have two of them. I recommend doing full body lifting days on these days. So you're activating the full body. Then if you must combine them because you want more resistance training, combine the resistance training with steady state cardio, either before or after, I really don't care, on your low carb, low fat days. And then one more very important thing for those of you that are not just trying to stay lean, but also trying to build muscle, you can get some extra benefit by adding some resistance training at the very end of a fasting day. So if one day per week you wanna take your long fast and you wanna train at the end of that fast, you could get a very big benefit there. I have plenty of other videos, just simply type in Thomas DeLauer uh, muscle building fasting. Uh, I've got a video that explains that. I'm not gonna go into it, spare you the details here. So the next video, we're gonna talk about a supplement protocol that's going to help you out with overall fat burning and staying lean year round as far as the mitochondria is concerned. See you tomorrow.